But be careful what you say now. <laughs> uh, let's I'll put it on the seat behind me. Yes. I'll put it on the seat behind me. Uh, or maybe inside your, your coat. Yeah. <laughs> I sure don't, so it doesn't matter. Um, now in your pocket? They are literally in front of us. Yeah, pocket here. <laughs> okay, okay. okay. Have a pocket here. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Thank you. <laughs> Hola. ¿Cómo estás? Muy bien. Bien. Hi, how are you? Are you okay? Gracias. So we start, we start, right? Good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to welcome you at Universidad Autónoma de Madrid. We're honored to host this meeting as part of the program, Defense and Me, My Role as a Citizen in the Face of New Threats, organized by S Global with the collaboration of the US Embassy in Spain. My sincere gratitude to Deputy Secretary of State, Wendy Sherman, and Ambassador Julissa Reynoso for your presence here. This conversation has been made even more timely and relevant because of recent events in Europe, and in particular because of Vladimir Putin's bloody invasion of Ukraine. This war is here to remind us that world order is fragile and vulnerable, and we must always be vigilant. Thank you, Deputy Secretary of State, for being with us today. They say that American presidencies are often defined by crises that no one saw coming. A year ago, at the time of President Biden's inauguration, no one could foresee these unfortunate events, which threatened to bring down a new Iron Curtain in Europe. I'm sure it will be very interesting to listen to your views on defense and security at these dramatic times for Europe and the Western world. Ambassador Reynoso, I want to take advantage of this opportunity to congratulate you for having been a nominated ambassador to Spain and Andorra. I hope, I know that you have recently arrived in Madrid, and I hope that you and your son, as well as your dogs, are settling in nicely. I wish you an enjoyable and successful stay among us. This university has strong links with the US. Numerous members of staff have obtained PhDs from prestigious American institutions or have been there as postdocs. I myself was at MIT in the years 1993-94 as a postdoctoral Fulbright scholar. And I was back in the States in UCLA and the University of California in Irvine a few years later. I always felt welcome and appreciated in the US. We have successful study abroad programs and student exchanges with several institutions in the US. And we have always collaborated closely with the Fulbright Commission and the US Embassy in Madrid. I do hope we can make that collaboration stronger during your term in Spain. And finally, let me welcome the participants in this meeting, both those uh, present here and those who are joining us online. I am, you have been very lucky to have been selected to be here today. And I am sure you will find this event very exciting and that you're aware that this is an excellent opportunity to engage in fruitful discussion. Because this is what we do at universities. Universities are places for constructive dialogue and debate of different ideas. They are committed to the peace and the well-being of the societies they serve. 
as rector of this university, I want to thank you all for your participation in this event that we proudly host. Thank you very much. You have to lift it. Yes. And then switch. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rectora. Thank you. And La Autonoma for hosting today's timely event with our very distinguished, extraordinary visitor, my dear friend, Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman. For those of you of us who've been around a bit, um, Deputy Secretary Sherman is a role model, especially for us women in this in this practice, in this profession. So I'm really uh, moved by her presence here and her visit to Spain and to, into my, my embassy. Um, I do want to keep the focus on the Deputy Secretary, but I'm also very pleased to be here, my first time here at, at the university, and her hope to return to La Autonoma in the future to discuss US-Spain bilateral relations with all of you and your colleagues and other students. And with that, uh, and with the gratitude to La Rectora for hosting us and all of these amazing contributors who are here present today, it is my honor and real uh, pleasure uh, to welcome Deputy Secretary Sherman to share her thoughts with us here today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam La Rectora. Uh, and when Ambassador Reynoso returns, she can do it in Spanish. Uh, uh, I wish uh, that I could. I actually came here uh, to the University of Madrid as a student when I was 15 for a summer. Uh, but my Spanish is terrible now, so, and my daughter, who is bilingual, is embarrassed every time I try, uh, so I'm not going to today, but hopefully I will uh, when I ultimately uh, retire. I have talking points, but I'm going to start in a slightly different place. I am so excited to be here today. Uh, before I became Deputy Secretary of State, first woman Secretary which is sort of pathetic that it took until 2021 for a woman to become deputy. But before I came here, I taught at the Kennedy School for Government at Harvard University. Uh, so I feel like I've come home to talk with students again. And everywhere I go, I try to talk with young people, with students, because you are the future. I am not. You see the world differently than I do. Your experience is different than mine. Uh, every time I have a problem with my computer, I scream for one of you uh, because it is second nature to you. I came here uh, to join uh, Ankela uh, Moreno Bao, the state secretary, in a Spain US cybersecurity conference, which you all understand completely in your very being, the world in which we are going to live. Uh, in this century and the next. Uh, this is something I have to learn and struggle with. And so it is critical to be here in Spain where you are a leader in the arena of cybersecurity. You are a leader in artificial intelligence and in technology and what the future will be like. It will be very different. We all learned some of this during the pandemic when we all had to live with each other virtually. I actually only saw Oculus virtually until today. Uh, so um, it was just a pleasure to be here, and I do hope uh, that soon, as we have just done in the United States, you were able to remove your masks indoors. We did it once before at the State Department, then of course Omicron came and we had to put them back on again, and we may have to do that in the future again, but it is good that we are moving forward in that arena. Um, I want to speak with you today as your rector said, about Ukraine. I think every single one of us, I know for me, I weep every day, inside if not outside, for what the people of Ukraine are going through. My grandmother came from what is now Ukraine. I have a picture, a photograph of me across from my desk, because when I was the undersecretary for political affairs during the Obama administration, I went to the Maidan after the uprising, 
after the change, after the freedom and the call for democracy that happened in Ukraine and made flowers at the memorial for those who had died in the Maidan. And I have that photograph across from my desk, never imagining for one moment that that democracy, that fragile but wonderful democracy was going to be invaded by Russia. I sat across from my Russian colleagues in a strategic stability dialogue twice before these extraordinary events, trying to talk about arms control and the future of two great nuclear powers to build down their nuclear weapons, to make sure there were arms control, make sure we didn't have a war in space, which you all are going to have to face. And then I found myself in an extraordinary session with my same Russian counterparts to try to say that Putin did not need to invade Ukraine, that we could deal with Russia's security concerns. It did not have to happen with death and destruction. All the deterrence in the world could not stop Vladimir Putin from what he had premeditated, what he has wrought an unjust, unprovoked, premeditated war against Ukraine. We have been working hard with Spain, who's been a phenomenal ally and leader with Europe, with NATO, with the rest of the world, quite frankly, with people all over the world to provide a diplomatic path to solve this problem, to deal with the security concerns in a reciprocal matter. But Putin alone, he alone, made the choice to reject diplomacy, to violate Ukraine's sovereignty, territorial integrity, and their right to choose their own future. Their right to choose their own future. Ukraine had chosen and has chosen democracy in 1991, in 2004, in 2014, and now. They've demonstrated that they will reject anyone who tries to take Ukraine backwards, who is not inspired and in awe of the strength and the resilience of the Ukrainian people, showcasing incredible bravery and resilience in the face of the biggest military assault in Europe in decades. The humanitarian situation is dire. More than a million people have fled Ukraine, some being welcomed with open arms here in Spain. Thank you so much for doing so. People in Ukraine facing shortages of food, medicine, power, water cutoffs in the dead of winter, in the dead of winter. Poland, Romania, Moldova, other EU countries stepping up in a really big way, Spain stepping up. People doing what their politics in other times would not permit them to do but seeing solidarity in their countries to join this fight. You all are beginning the process for granting temporary residence permits, welcoming refugees, uh, people filling up Facebook with offers of their homes. Russia, besides this horrifying invasion, cracking down on people in their own country, we do not blame the Russian people for Putin's war. This is Putin's war, not the war of the Russian people. Like all autocrats, Putin is in fact afraid of his own people. He has detained mothers and children for bringing flowers to, Ukrainian, to the Ukrainian embassy. Imagine that, a child bringing flowers to the Ukrainian embassy detained by a government. 
Up until uh, yesterday, Russia had, uh, Putin had arrested more than 9,000 protesters. Yesterday alone, 4,600 more in one day. He has forbidden news outlets from saying the words war or invasion. He has shut down the last independent media. A week ago, uh, less than a week ago, I gave an interview to a Russian media outlet. The next day, it was shut down. There's a new law with penalties of up to 15 years for not parroting the Kremlin's lies about the war, forcing Western outlets to exit, to leave Russia. Internet regulators throttled Facebook and Twitter and then shut down access. We have told Americans to leave Russia immediately or they may be detained. They are at risk. The global outpouring of support for Ukraine has been phenomenally and wonderfully overwhelming. Huge protests in European capitals. Only four countries voted with Russia in the UN General Assembly against the resolution opposing war. What a club to belong to, Syria, North Korea, Belarus, Eritrea, and Russia. That was it. Even Cuba abstained. Nicaragua abstained. Lethal defensive aid. The US has provided more than a billion dollars worth to Ukraine in the last year alone. Spain recently reversed policy and is providing lethal defensive aid as well as humanitarian aid. Putin is failing in his strategic objectives and he has become already a pariah. NATO didn't fracture. Exactly what Putin wanted to have happen, exactly the opposite has happened. NATO is stronger than ever. The EU, the G7, moved very quickly on sanctions, completely coordinated effort, seeing effects already. Neutral Switzerland and Monaco imposing sanctions, Finland and Sweden stepping up, Germany and other EU countries increasing defense spending. The debates we've had about the increase of defense spending to NATO, gone, everyone is. Soccer, ice hockey, ice skating, Formula One, and my favorite, judo. <laughs> Banning Russian teams from international competitions and removing Vladimir Putin from any positions he held. Your generation will feel the impacts. The world changed overnight. We are not the same. However, this horrible situation ends, and I fear it will end horribly. We will not go back to the way we were. We are just beginning to think about what that will mean for our future. Will it slow down our efforts toward climate change, addressing climate change? I know something that at least at the Kennedy School was number one, along with social justice for the students there. It probably will because of the needs of energy security in Europe. Renewables take time. What will we do in the meantime to wean Europe off of Russian oil? Not so much Spain, but the rest of Europe. What will it mean for how countries line up, how they vote? Will autocrats win? Or is this a new time for democracy, for the values that we all hold dear? What will change? Global health security has already changed because of the pandemic. Cyber and emerging technology space, it will all be different for you all. 
The PRC's, the People Republic of China's challenges to the rules-based international order, does that get stronger? Or does China hedge its bets after this? Though their manifesto before the Olympics seemed to indicate that they were lining up with Russia. I think Russia lied to them. I know Russia lied to them. I think they thought that if Russia was invading, it was just about the Donbass, not the whole country. We knew better. Sadly, America knew better. We are, I don't mean to be so heavy, <laughs> except that we live in a heavy time. And we all need to think hard about the challenges in front of us, but also think about what opportunities it creates to think about energy security in a different way, to urge that we think holistically about global health. We think about the value of democracy and fight for it with a renewed abandon. So there are hopefully some good things that will come out of this horror. But today, every day, we will also have to stand with the Ukrainian people in every way we possibly can. The United States is now contemplating everything from shutting off oil imports to helping Poland uh, deliver MiGs to putting the evidentiary packages together for war crimes. We know that Europe is thinking about all these things as well. I don't know all the answers today, but we need to consider every avenue to stop the madness and also make sure it does not spread further into Europe. So thank you all for welcoming me today. I welcome your questions. I also welcome your comments and your thoughts because um, I know you all aren't shy, <laughs> but you will tell me what you think, and I look forward to it. Thank you very much. So let's move into the conversation. Madam Deputy Secretary of the State of the United States, it's an honor to have you here in this meeting. We are amazed at the fact that despite the extremely serious circumstances that we are facing, a person with a position with a completely full agenda, you have decided to hold and join this event with the students, a young people who develop their incipient work in the areas of uh, international relationships, security, economy, and intelligence. U.S. Ambassador to U.S. in Spain. Um, Excuse Mr. me, Reynoso. can you move your mic just a little closer to you? Yeah, sure. Mr. Reynoso, the work that the embassy does uh, with you so professional and human team is very impressive. And we cannot be more humble and grateful to be able to collaborate in activities like this, in which S Global is making a, a huge difference. And Rectora. <laughs> How to, how to thank the Universidad Autónoma for hosting this event with our students and the students from more public and private institutions. Once again, the Academy is united and collaborative, generating spaces for the chains of knowledge and for the unit, the intelligence unit uh, analysis. Uh, we can only emphasize our gratitude to, Moen, to having a, 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 made a, a meeting like this possible. And the students' question have been brought into the thematic series structure around some particular relevant topics. So Christina, uh, whatever you want, we can begin breaking the ice with the first questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Deputy Secretary of State, thank you for sharing your insights and for your time today. Uh, Mrs. Ambassador, Rectora, Directora, thank you for making this event possible. On behalf of this Global, um, it's a pleasure to contribute to the dissemination of this culture of defense that, as we see every day, is more needed than, than ever. Uh, let me also thank all of you here and there who have been sending your questions for this event. We have got many of them. We won't be able to share all of them with you, but I will give in, uh, be giving the floor to some of the students for them to post them to you. And, um, and maybe in, in some other format, we have the chance to, to answer all of them. If it is OK for you, I'll group three of them first, then you'll answer, sure. and then we'll pass to the, to the rest one. So firstly, I want to ask Aida Lorca, Arthur, to make her yeah. question, comment. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you very much in advance for coming and spending some time with us. My name is Aida Lorca. I'm a student of journalism and international relations, and currently I'm the vice president of communication of the Youth Atlantic Treaty Association branch here in Madrid, in uh, the Spanish one. And my first question is about NATO, that it was created in the context of the Cold War, in which the greatest danger to the free world was Russia. Until before the war in Ukraine, the main focus had shifted to the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, so my question is, is NATO's purpose to be expanded to that area, including countries uh, such as Japan or perhaps Taiwan to protect democratic states of the region? Or should NATO create a NATO China uh, Council, as is the case specifically of Russia, to avoid the risk of overstanding the alliance and thus opening a di dialogue with Beijing? And quickly, thinking into consideration that tomorrow is Women's Day. Um, numerous media outlets point to the fact that at the upcoming summit in Madrid, the first female secretary general of the organization will be elected. And some names are the former uh, presidents of Estonia, Croatia, and so on. By doing so, does the Alliance want to emphasize its commitment to women's equality and give it a new boost in its new strategic concept? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Aida. Uh, let me also pick picking up on, on your comment, the fact that the four main people here are women, which is also <laughs> to be highlighted. Uh, let me now pass the floor to Marta. Marta Garcia. Marta, please. I'm Marta Garcia, a student of international relations at the Universidad Francisco de Vitoria. Among the things that the Secretary General of NATO has pointed out will be key in the upcoming Madrid summit are cybersecurity, the, the technological edge, the security impact of climate change. Seeing that the focus points seem to be changing from the traditional defense based on the military, is traditional military development going to stop or at least step down? And considering the latest actions of Russia, which is an important military power, is it wise to turn all attention into new threats and abandon a bit the traditional ones? Thank you. Thank you, Marta. Now, now I'll give the floor to Pablo Lacan. Ah, gracias. Thank you, Ma'am Deputy. Um, my name is Marc Pablo. I'm studying international relations and sociology in Universidad Complutense de Madrid. In this case, I would like to ask you about the potential role of the United States in the Morocco-Algerian conflict. Mm -hmm. In this current situation, is Biden's administration contemplating modifying its position about Morocco's and West Sahara sovereignty? And, that, and how can that affect the Morocco-Algerian diplomatic crisis, including Maghreb's pipeline situation, which di directly affects Spain and Europe's gas supply. Thank you. Well, thank you for all those questions. Let me do the NATO ones. To, um, I think that, um, first of all, I'm all for a woman uh, Secretary General. So. If that will so my up off to you. I agree with you completely. Um, so uh, it's very terrific that the NATO summit will be held here in Spain in June. I think it is um, really a tribute to Spain's leadership uh, and will be in a very important event as NATO considers uh, the 2030 strategic concept. And when that was first thought about, uh, it was indeed not about a Russian threat. <laughs> Uh, it um, was very forward-leaning. Forward Commitment countries able to have a convention at that convention capabilities that deal with all manner of things. Uh, many military
disaster assistance. Um, militaries are not just to fight wars. Uh, they are also to deal with other kinds of threats. Um, our military is spending time thinking, as I've said a couple of times today, because I think it's such an important future issue, space. Will there be weapons in space? Um, when I was having discussions with uh, useful, um, we both agreed that although we all have capabilities to do things with artificial intelligence, that no weapon should ever be used without a human hand. That no weapon should be allowed to act on its own through artificial intelligence without a human being being part of that decision-making process. So there's a lot to think about going into the future. Others in Europe, this is going in and out. I could hear it. Okay. That's okay. Is that working better? Okay. Uh, so, this is very exciting now. <laughs> um, what do you want? What else? Okay. Hold on, I have to get this out of my pocket. Okay, and then we can just continue. Yeah. Okay. Ready to go now. Uh, so, issues like climate and cybersecurity are still going to be relevant to the 2030 concept, and they are not separate and apart from conventional military. It is all part of a holistic approach to defense. It is very important for us all to remember that NATO is a defensive alliance. It is not an offensive alliance. It does not take territory. It does not go after people. Uh, there is one article, Article 5, uh, which is very famous, which is an attack on one is an attack on all. The only time Article 5 has ever been invoked by NATO was after the 9-11 attack on the United States, NATO came to the support of the United States. In Afghanistan to go after ISIS, the perpetrators, I'm sorry, of Al-Qaeda, the perpetrators of 9-11, uh, but it's the only time. And even Article 5 does not require a conventional military response. One can decide how best to response that is effective if there was another abrogation of Article 5. And let's hope that there will not be an attack on a NATO country by Russia in the days ahead, because it would indeed be World War III if that occurred. Um, on uh, the Indo-Pacific, there's no doubt that NATO needs to think about how the threats in the Indo-Pacific affect Europe and the NATO alliance. But it does not mean that NATO is going to create, spread itself thin and embrace all the countries in Asia. Asia is building its own security architecture. Um, and the United States, with India, Japan, and Australia, uh, has uh, started the Quad, which will be part of that infrastructure, not so much in the conventional military sense, uh, but in uh, issues uh, like disaster assistance global health security, all of these things that are critical to the future. Then on one of my favorite issues, um, the Western Sahara, Morocco, Algeria. Uh, when I leave Spain, um, maybe the sun will come out, the beautiful sun of Spain, <laughs> before I go. 
That's okay. I've been here before. I will be here again. Um, I'm going to Morocco and then Algeria and then Egypt, uh, sort of North Africa. The United States and greatly appreciates Spain's support for Stefan de Mistura, the new UN envoy, to try to, in fact, see if we can't resolve what has been a longstanding and difficult situation. Uh, the United States um, uh, stands with where we are, uh, but we really look to the UN envoy uh, to mediate uh, this difficult situation in a way that um, supports the interests of the countries involved, including the interests of Spain. So that's about as much as I can say here today. No surprise, I'm sure. Okay. Thank you very much. Maybe we have time for another quick round of, of questions. Sure. Uh, so I'll give the floor to Raquel uh, de Jorge. Okay. So first of, uh, first of all, Madam Deputy Secretary of State, thank you very much for coming here. I am Raquel Jorge and I am a policy analyst at the Cano Royal Institute, uh, which is a think tank here based in Madrid. And I was also a, a former Fulbright Fellow in Washington, D.C., so I really appreciate your thoughts and your, your presence here. Right. So my, my main question is about Spain-U.S ties in, term, in terms of cyber security. So we see, and as you, Madam, have said, that uh, Spain is one of the most cyber mature countries worldwide, and this is actually acknowledged by the Belfast Center's uh, Cyber Power Index and some other indexes worldwide. So I would like to know more, more about your thoughts on further lines of collaboration between Spain and the United States. I think, for example, about uh, common views that both countries may have in terms of export controls on dual-use technologies, FDI for indirect investments. Also, what do you think about uh, main possibilities of, of inviting Spain to the task force on ransomware, which was which got started last year by the National Security Council? Because I personally think that it may be pretty good and pretty effective to to have a Spain be part of. Thank you. And just a final question, because I'm, I'm afraid we are running out of time. I'll give the floor to Juanjo Gómez, now from Autonoma University here. Juanjo, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Juanjo Gómez, student of international... Oh, gracias. Student of international studies in this university, Universidad Autónoma. And I wanted to ask... An, um, uh, question related to the economy. So, Juanjo, given the rise. Juanjo, of, sorry, can you raise your voice a little bit, please? Uh, uh, okay. Given the rise of cryptocurrencies as a functional currency in the digital and even national spheres, as is the case in El Salvador, is the United States considering using this resource as a possible alternative to the dollar in case its international power is diminished by external agents, such as the imposition of sanctions or the rise of other currencies like the euro or the yen, a change that may be promoted by the current conflict? If this is not the case, do you have a comment on its regularization on a national and international level? Thank you. So could you start the beginning of your question i got the end but i didn't get the beginning because your voice was low at the start oh so is the united states considering using this resource as a possible alternative to the dollar in the case that its international power is diminished by external agents what using what resource a cryptocurrencies oh cryptocurrency sorry that's what i missed okay so in terms of Spain and US cybersecurity, it is why we are having this seminar today and so glad uh, for your leadership. And as you point out, there are several indexes that really have Spain quite high up in the index as a country that understands this challenge. Um, the seminar is going all day today. Uh, the United States has brought a large delegation to it. Uh, and every one of the topics that you put on your list uh, is on the list of this seminar, if not, and more. Um, I think this is an area in which we can absolutely do more work together, uh, and I expect good results to come out of this today. 
on, on everything from export controls to ran ransomware and beyond. Uh, and it, it, excellent uh, agenda for the entire day. Uh, several panels on many topics. Uh, so thank you for your interest in this and thank you for your own work on it. It's important. On uh, cryptocurrency, um, right now uh, the uh, dollar is the reserve currency of the world uh, and it has worked effectively in that regard. But we are quite well aware that when we use our secondary sanctions, which means that we say to a country, if you do business with X country, you can't do business with us. That's called secondary sanctions. And most countries want to do business with the United States and want to be able to use the dollar. Uh, therefore, it's a very powerful sanction, as you point out. So we are aware if we use this secondary sanction concept too often, more and more countries will look for other ways uh, to uh, bypass us, either by a basket of traditional currencies or through cryptocurrency. Uh, so we're aware of that. And quite frankly, I'm not smart enough to imagine where the world will go by the time you're my age, which is quite a while, um, and whether cryptocurrency will have replaced dollars. Now, we all understand most of you better than I do, that cryptocurrencies and blockchain concepts have upsides and downsides. They can be more democratic, sort of like Facebook was, but they can also be used as instruments of trafficking, of criminality, of hackers, bad hackers as opposed to anonymous, who's currently hacking Russia, um, and, and can be used in very bad ways. Uh, so I think there is a lot of a lot to think through when it comes to cryptocurrency, but clearly it's gaining some traction. Uh, but we have to make sure that it is used for good and not for bad. And we don't have all the controls uh, yet uh, to allow us to make use of cryptocurrency in the right way. You know, years ago, no one had credit cards. You probably can't imagine such a time. Uh, but there was such a time, let alone, you know, all of the things that you all do on your phones that don't even need a credit card, whether it's PayPal or Vino or um, other concepts. So my guess is the world will change in this regard. I just don't know how. But let's just make sure that whatever happens, uh, coming back to the beginning of this discussion, that we reinforce the values of democracy and not the values of autocrats and dictators. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much again for all your questions and, of course, for your answers. Let me now give the floor to Rector Amaya Mendiocicheta for the closing remarks. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much again, Madam Deputy Secretary of State, for your heartfelt and inspiring talk, and all of you for this interesting discussion and exchange of ideas. For everybody, but particularly for this generation, these are challenging times. We've been through a global pandemic with devastating effects, which has not been defeated yet. We're on the threshold of a new world, which will be marked by artificial intelligence, technology, and the fight against climate change, a world in which poverty and inequality persist in many corners of the planet. We've become used to seeing images of war in places like Syria and Afghanistan, which from our Western perspective seem really far away, but we cannot ignore the humanitarian crisis that they have caused. And yet, we're witnessing a momentous period. The people of Ukraine, fight for the existence of their nation against the Russian invaders. What the US and Europe do could shape the course of history. I said in the opening remarks that I was a Fulbright scholar, by like somebody else here. The Fulbright program was created in the aftermath of World War II by the US Congress. Its goal, to prevent future conflicts by providing opportunities for US citizens to exchange ideas and create connections with people from other countries. Quoting Senator Fulbright, the Fulbright program aims to bring a little, a little more knowledge, a little more reason, and a little more compassion 
into world affairs, and thereby to increase the chance that nations will learn at last to live in peace and friendship. The idea that education is key to understanding between nations is also behind the successful Erasmus program in Europe, which was established in 1987 and that has promoted the mobility of millions of European students and staff. This program has been considered key in building a European identity. We lay down our arms so we can reach out our arms to one another. This is from Amanda Gorman's inaugural poem, The Hill We Climb. The whole world watched her powerful performance in delivering a poem that called for unity and justice through both reckoning with the nation's past and looking towards his future. She was addressing the American people, but her words are universal. And I quote, and I apologize because reading poetry in another language is really difficult. <laughs> we seek harm to none and harmony for all. Let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true, that even as we grieved, we grew, that even as we hurt, we hoped, that even as we tired, we tried, that we'll forever be tied together, victorious, not because we will never again know defeat, but because we will never again sow division." End of quote. In these dark times, education brings us hope. Events like this bring us hope. People like you bring us hope. Thank you very much. <laughs>